struggling with and I've been I've been struggling with Windows all morning. Um, my morning was spent in trying to fix a Windows laptop with broken updates. So apparently, uh -oh. on my wife's on my wife's laptop, um, Windows update happened yesterday, and uh -oh. uh, it decided to kill everything. So the laptop works, but nothing else works. Like. It, it has two GPU, so it has like the NVIDIA GPU on it, and it has a built-in Intel one. It disabled mm -hmm. the Intel one, the, the NVIDIA GPU, so it like doesn't work, just completely dead. So, okay, I've been trying to fix that this morning, uh, like spend some um, time and effort on that, like uh, trying to set up. Uh, there's like a way you can reset Windows updates, and it, it, like there's Windows updates that are, are pending and are failing, like one of them is for NVIDIA, and it just fails mm -hmm. with an error. And the, 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 the solution is just reset windows uh, reset windows updates completely and i did that Womp, didn't work so yeah i uh, on used that, note, that as well let's welcome note, people and then i can moan about my one okay welcome people welcome to the stream welcome to the friday morning stream or friday morning bean streaming where uh my good friend kobus and i uh, get to talk about technology the cloud and anything in between so um um, today is Friday, October 30th, um, and today's topic is going to be a storage on AWS. There's different types of storage, yeah. there's different ways you can store data on AWS and stuff. So today we're going to be uh, looking into a bit into all of that. But before we continue, Kobus, complain. Yes, complain. <laughs> so I had a fun situation with Windows a few years back where this was, what was it? It's a second generation i5 quad core um, just to put a like rough era on it, uh, mainstream motherboard was either Gigabyte or Asus. Um, okay. So once again, nothing exotic. And at one point, there was a period of about three, four months where I had to disable all Windows updates because as soon as it installed that update, the you would get to the Windows boot screen and we're going to the reboot loop. And nothing that I did could actually um, fix it. Um, hey, Wapples. Hey, Wapples. Welcome back. Um, and it was literally like one of those things like I was super paranoid because... At first, I thought I did something wrong. Then I did a completely okay. clean install. It worked. Install updates, same story. Did it a second mm -hmm. time, same story. And then I realized, like, okay, no, no, something is seriously broken over here. So I just went, you know, screw that. No, so sometimes, I mean, Windows, like when, and during my sysadmin days, when I would manage a, a Windows network and all that stuff, it would... It would, it would cause me so much pain, Windows updates, especially if you manage to, like, you have... A thousand computers up uh, on oh, there yeah. and uh, accepting updates, and you you're pretty certain that you tested it all, and it just works, and just but uh then -huh. dies. So oh my god, the good old days of WSS. In WSS, yeah. <laughs> so yep, um, and, we've and all same, today. Yeah, and and now like it's on a very uh, micro scale. Like my wife's laptop just doesn't work, and she needs to finish this uh, project she's working on by the weekend, and. I have a living room PC, so I might just let her use the living room PC and just do it there. You've got a PC um, living in your living room? Exactly. It's paying rent. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, it's it's basically just... just um, so we'll see. if I, I'm going to try to fix the Windows. I mean, oh, at the end of the day, I can always just reinstall Windows. Um, and this one yeah. is... The, I think I think there's, there's a combination of problems here. It's a Windows which came in German. Right, so I bought the laptop. It had uh, oh, uh, that's Windows. Good. <laughs> yeah, it had German Windows on it, and I changed the language to English. But it, Windows has this thing where it stores like um, um, specific um, program data, like C slash program data. It's a hidden directory mm -hmm. where it contains like application data and profiles and something like that. The German one is in German, so if you go into the C program data. The name of the directory is like application data is in German, and uh, <laughs> if you try to do something right now, it just breaks. Oh uh, so, wow! So I think I think something is there, right? Some directory paths are broken Oof. for some reason, and I, I, like that language localization should be just visual. No thing, nothing should ever change if you uh, localize things. So please, localization people yeah. on operating systems, just just don't. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll I'll try to fix that uh, as we go along. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I'm talking to myself, yeah. Burek, um, Burek, um So, yeah, <laughs> apparently. Mm, indeed. <laughs> He's twin. Um, before we get into storage, I yep. get to be happy for uh, um, for a change because I upgraded multiple things in my office um, yesterday. Um, okay. So, firstly, you know about my little furry animal that I now have um, yep. that, I, that I get to play with all the time. 
Um, and finally, my Amazon order came. So now my camera will not let run out of power. It finally oh, has an AC nice. uh, battery, fancy. And yes, it took me five minutes to figure out how that little piece of rubber goes out the way because I set a wait spot at the front to actually get the cable. Because I knew it had to close. I just like upside down and then finally said stuff that took the camera off. And then, oh, there it is. Yeah, don't ask. Um, didn't have coffee. Um, and <laughs> a weird one, I now have got rollerblade wheels on my desk chair. I don't know if you've seen them wheels. before. Uh, yeah, yeah, you get them. Uh, uh, I, yeah. They, yeah, oh, they, the little box looks like those little wheels, yeah. I bought those as well, but they don't fit my chair. So I cannot, I cannot, oh. like, yeah. Um, so I have a box of them <laughs> sitting back, just, just useless, yeah. So I can imagine how, how better that is. It's a bit more, uh, okay. a bit more um, wheelie. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit more wheelie because I've got a, because I've got a wooden floor and um, a thinnish carpet yeah. That's because of my wheeling no longer stuck to it. So it's 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 a little bit weird. Yeah. Um and then the last funny one which I find hilarious is that my poor monitor arm on this side. Um my wife went to fetch her screens from work, so she now has got two nice it's a four K and a fourteen forty P screen instead of the two uh ten eighty P screens that she had, twenty seven okay. inches. So I've now obviously one of them used to be mine, then gave it to her, then now I've taken it back. So I replaced the the 19 inch or 20 inch that I had on that side. Okay. The challenge is that the monitor arm is only rated to go up to 24 inches, which means ah. that I put the screen up and then slowly over the next 10 seconds, <laughs> and then it thunks on the table. Yeah. Uh, I have the opposite problem. I have a monitor arm or actually a monitor stand for a 28 inch screen. And mm -hmm. uh, I've removed the 28 inch screen and put it on the top of, the, of, a, of a different monitor arm. And I put a 1080p on this one. Um, and it's so light that it cannot go down. So I, I try to push it down. The springs bring it back up. So yeah, <laughs> it's I've seen that as well. It's like, it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to figure this out, but latest worries. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Dennis. Uh, and Dennis, yeah. this is, yes, that's, that's, that's the... This is the this is the location on a German Windows, uh, and yeah, it, it, it apparently that potentially has broken some Windows updates. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I don't know. But um, uh, uh, this is something I'm going to be trying to fix. So before we get into the, to today's topic uh, at hand, uh, first of all, I want to wish everybody a happy Friday. I hope you are all doing well. And um, I'm not sure how it is with you, Kobus, but today is a very nice and rainy Friday uh, in Germany, and it's a uh, it's a very relaxed thing. Um, no, so, it's it's getting into summer here. It's getting slightly warmer, but today is cool. It's only nineteen. It's weird. Or <laughs> it's supposed to be piping hot by now, but it's yeah. weird. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, cooler years are, are are better, I guess. Um, so, Kubus, anything from this series, this week that we have released that has uh, uh, um, that has sparked your interest so far? Is mm. there something that you could remember? Yes, that was released there was. That potentially. I, I need to go just quickly search for it okay. in news because there was something. This is a big one. Uh, auto scaling is now available in Cape Town. Okay, that wasn't available. Yes. Wow. Um, it wasn't. I, I didn't actually know that. It's uh, and also in Milan. So I, to be dead honest, I was under the impression this launched um, when the region launched. But I mean, that's you know yeah. a big one. Yeah. 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 I would expect that that would come. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So uh, there's a, this other big thing that, uh, again, I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, because um, we were even, even called out for it um, by Ian. Um, nitro enclaves. Mm. Um, so um, bear with us. Uh, do you know what nitro, nitro enclaves are? Would you know how to explain them? Let's try. <laughs> okay. Nitro en enclave is a piece of custom hardware that we add to our servers that um, uh, it handles the virtualization as well as the encryption of the various things running and communicating with the hardware. So from the, the LAN or across the LAN, it does some of the encryption and decryption and handles that to the actual uh, physical machine. And part of that is that you can have these little enclaves where you can install certain software um, some of it being our software um, with specific encryption things, which means it's outside of the visualization, um, the hypervisor slash host, which means it runs completely separate. And that adds additional security with the way you interact with the actual host, physical host at the end of okay. the day, I think. How close is that? Uh, almost. So um, the thing that you were talking about, the, the thing that does the hardware is called a dongle. 
Uh, but oh, um, yeah. yeah, Nitro Enclaves are, uh, so I'm reading off a blog post here. Uh, Nitro Enclaves is the new EC2 capability that enables customers to create isolated compute environments, enclaves or enclaves, uh, to further protect and securely process highly sensitive data such as personally personally identifiable information, oh. AI, healthcare, financial, and intellectual property within their EC2 instances. Nitro Enclaves help customers reduce the attack surface area of their most sensitive data processing applications. So basically, my 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 vision is that like I I I I know about Nitro Enclaves from last year's reInvent when we uh, announced mm -hmm. them and preview and launched a preview. Um, and from this one, so basically, it's, think of it as a as a little sidecar instance next to your instance that's only accessible to that EC2 instance through this highly secure protocol oh, communication. Okay. Right. And if you want to do additional compute on some very sensitive data instead of computing on your main EC2 instance, which is pot potentially exposed to the internet, you can have this little tiny bit of um, of compute out there that just um, um, you can pass the data onto it and, and that processing can be done on that one. So that's my take that's on it. Um, but <laughs> I may be wrong. So I, again, I, mm. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out this, what, what, what this is it, what this is. Um, so it's, um, okay. So actually let's, let's, let's open up this because I, I want, I want, I want yeah, to, let's to, dig to, into it. to dig into this one because I don't, I don't really know. Um, so let's, let's have a look. Um, Okay, this is the entire, you know, um, isolated computer for mine. This is what I told you, um, reduce the attack surface area, but I, I want to have a look at this. So you have a Nitro Enclave. Uh, you launch a compatible Nitro-based EC2 instance, right? By enable And enable the Nic uh, Enclave mm -hmm. option, right? Then you have to use the Nitro CLI to uh, convert your application to an Enclave image file. Then using the enclave image file uh, as an input, use the Nitro CLI to create an enclave or enclave. Um, the enclave is a separate virtual machine with its own kernel memory and CPU, right? So in essence, you can process highly sensitive data, not on the EC2, install, EC2 instance itself, but using the CLI, it will run somewhere else, basically next to your instance on another compute unit that's a completely separate operating system. Um, not vulnerable. So, like, even if you have some potential issues on your system, uh, you can you can remove that to somewhere else. So, mm -hmm. that's how I see it. Right? It, it only has this. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I think I get it. Um, mm -hmm. So the difference being is that uh, an EC2 virtual machine runs on the physical machine with a shared hypervisor between all of the different VMs. Correct. Which means that if for whatever reason there is some kind of way to break out of the VM. Yeah. It means you could potentially end up next one. Obviously, that's not something that happens yeah. based um, because we keep an eye out, um, on this and everything. Yeah. Um, so this allows yeah. you to take it and actually split it up in a physical different section where there is no shared underlying operating system. So there is no mechanism to break out of the hypervisor and into the host next door. Correct, correct. And like okay. it's, it's, as Dennis says, there's no SSH. Like the, the local channel is not a communication channel. Like you cannot have, you know, you cannot log into this enclave or whatever. Mm -hmm. It just uh, works through the Nitro CLI. So um, that's how kind of how it works, right? You have this socket okay. connection, local uh, socket connection from the parent instance to the enclave, and that's it, right? So um, this that's is interesting. Very interesting. Like, I'm, I'm still trying to, you know, try and find a full on solution. What I would use this for, I don't work with sensitive mm. data, so that's uh, potentially not a, not a thing, but according to the use cases, um, you know, tokenization, multi-party computation, um, interesting, um, securing private keys, isolate private keys, uh, in an enclave while preventing users applications library from parent instance from viewing those keys. Normally, those keys are stored on EC2 instance in plain text, right? There we go. You can store your keys on an enclave and then basically just access them uh, programmatically through your um, EC2 instance. I guess that's a way yeah, to do really it. Interesting. Yeah. But it has its own its own its own CLI, so yeah. I, I'm I'm, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm I'm gonna be waiting to see what people do with this. Um, and and here's the thing, folks. A lot of a lot of services that launch in AWS are, are just like that. We launch it and then see what people do with it. <laughs> and um, that's how we kind of. Um, uh, how, uh, how we move it, and then it says I can imagine using this similar to an HSM. Yeah, exactly. Hardware security model mm. module. So basically, having this as a uh, uh, not a hardware but a virtual security model attached to your instance that can um, be only communicated with something. Yeah, just to clarify, we have got virtual HSM as as a service as right. well. So right. yeah, yeah. Okay, this is this is actually very interesting. 
No. I don't want to dig it because this is kind of like there are a lot of things like, for example, with networking, I can basically go down to the almost the datagram level of explaining what the packet looks like when it goes over the wire. Yeah. But that's why I become fuzzy. And this is now with security. It's like I understand the PKI infrastructure and things, but it's like when you get down to the physical, yeah. like I know to do derived keys and parent keys and things, but it's like. Uh. Well, the difference between this and HSM is that HSM, you, you need internet, uh, you need, um, you need um, TCP connectivity. Network outside mm. to access it when it comes to enclaves enclaves are sitting basically next to your ec2 instance and you have only a local socket connection so it doesn't have to use mm -hmm. even the the ip stack at all so um it can do just the local local yeah. at, at least that's my 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 guess on this i, I may be wrong but <laughs> um but i i don't think it, it it has anything to do with ip networking in this case so i don't think mm. the the enclave has um networking enabled at all so but that i mean again Additional layer of security is always good. I mean, ha giving mm. you the ability to do this. Now, of course, you will not use this for your general purpose web servers or whatnot. There are specific use cases for this. So, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm mm. waiting to see what they what they're gonna be. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, what else? What else is there? Something else new? I'm looking at my RSS feed here to see if mm, there's something same. else that kind of sticks out um, uh, from that has oh, been launched. Yeah. What else do we have? We got auto scaling. We got SageMaker, but that was on the twenty second. So that was last before last mm -hmm. Friday. So we spoke about that. Um, this is a nice, nice thing. Uh, EC two image builder, um, the the service that does um, building of well EC two images of AMIs, uh, now supports um, uh, distributing uh, AMIs across multiple accounts. So that's a pretty yes. useful feature. So that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. Um, how how yeah, did you do it before? Also? How did you do it before? Um, I know you were you were doing it. I was using Packer. So with Packer, you, in your JSON file at the top, you just have a little, uh, there's literally a list that you give, like which accounts do you want to share this to? And then, because remember, it's a copy action. It's not a, uh, no, sorry. It is a share action, not a okay. copy action. Yeah. Um, and that's how I used to do it. I mean, I, and this is just, I've been, I used Packer for like years. Um, I think first time was probably 2015, I want to say. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I know Packer was the solution to uh, to AWS mm. uh, AMI creation, and it still is. Uh, Packer is a lovely tool. I've used it a few times, and I just mm. love the way you just <laughs> write it out, and it just does the thing. Yeah. So I'm a fan of that. Uh, but okay, something not technical related to an extent. This. Tuck, tuck. Tuck, tuck. You can register for reInvent now. So uh, registrations are open. Yes. Um, they have we have mm. been delayed for some for some reason. Uh, but if you want to re jo join reInvent, which is happening on the when uh, November thirtieth uh, in a month, <laughs> register. It's free. It's available for everybody. It's going to be virtual. It's going to be online. Uh, so um, make sure to hit that register button and and basically get get access to all the amazing talks by amazing speakers. I don't even know how many stocks are going to be, but um, I know that we have a um, a big push and a, and a big um, um, a, 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 a big uh, basically uh, there's a big organization behind getting everybody to speak. Not just including us, we'll have folks from the community, we'll have heroes, mm. we have all the things. So um, it's going to be great. Um, I am gonna. I am think. I think it's going to be just um, wonderful this year, especially because. Everybody can join now. Uh, you know, Reno knows this exclusive thing that you can go, you have to go to the United States and uh, potentially get the, some of the keynotes online. Mm. But now everybody can see everything. So, yes, cool. Um, yeah, I think I just lost that. I sent out a tweet last night. I'm trying to remember timelines now. It's getting a little bit blurry over here. Um, it's <laughs> end of the week. I think it's Friday, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, it's my um my week's been particularly disruptive because um, early in the morning I jump on calls with people in Singapore and Australia, and then in the um, evenings it's hello Seattle, so oh. it's been it's been interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thursday two point oh. Mm. There's uh, <laughs> oh, if, if yeah. you do want some entertainment, go read. There's an article by the Onion from years ago. And the title is "It's Only Tuesday." Um, it's oh. quite quite <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, so taking this question quickly from Sochad um, is so uh, not quite subsidiary. Remember, reInvent is an AWS event. It's not a Amazon event, even though it's Amazon Web Services. We are a separate company. And then in terms of the actual speakers, so 
We've got a whole bunch of AWS people lined up. We also have some of our AWS heroes that are doing yeah. sessions. We have got some of our community builders doing sessions. We have got partners doing sessions. Um, we also have, there obviously there are some vendor talks as well. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing a big group. Oh, and then like the developer lounge, which is the community. Um, yeah. And we're also doing various like pre-recorded as well as um, live streams of those. Um, so the live streams are actually the interesting one. It's like I've mentioned a couple of times this week. It's like for the first time ever, well, second time technically, because I knew when okay. the Cape Town region was launching a few days before it did. Um, this is only the second time where I actually know of something that's going to come out that's not yet public um, because we've got some streaming sessions coming up and I'm yes. looking at uh, container sessions and I'm like, so, I want these, I want these. Yeah, so one of the things that you will see on 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 reInvent this year is going to be you're going to be seeing a lot of us, not just the speakers, but we're going to be doing a lot mm. of live streaming during that event. Um, uh, there's this thing called uh, what is it? How are we calling it? Uh, uh, AWS on air or something like that. Uh, basically, mm. what Kobusma just mentioned, we're going to be speaking to product teams, to uh, service teams about their new releases uh, live on Twitch. I think mm. it's going to be Twitch. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know if it's going to be Twitch or not on mm. something. So make sure to register. And to answer the question from uh, Lost Algorithm, yeah. Um, no, just, no, no. Just, it's something much more important. Again. Yeah. No, no. So just quickly, it doesn't help with our performance reviews. It's, it's something much more important than a performance review, yeah. which is we've got an internal thing called phone tool icons. Uh, oh. Phone tool is just an internal um, directory. And what that does is that you can get like these phone tool icons for various things like speaking at an event or doing certain training or... yeah being the top referrer for certain events. Now, unfortunately, we don't have one for reInvent, but uh, we did recently have it for the modern application uh, dev day. Yeah, this um, is where and we were, I'm happy to say. This is where we were having a little competition internally. So Yes, that's why we were shilling, uh, or shilling out uh, our links earlier. And uh, I am uh, ha both happy and sad to say that Darker actually beat me. Um, ah. Sad because it's a competition, but happy because his video with his screen behind you was a lot better than my um, LinkedIn endeavor so i'm happy that we figured out the stats in here actually yeah <laughs> but that's fine yeah. but uh, here's what you can do you can uh, you can register and if it asks you for which sessions you want to attend search my name so <laughs> i have two presentations so just register I, i'm not sure if you can register for my presentation or whatever but i'm having mm. two talks so um they should be relatively interesting i have the pr the presentations finished um i have um i need to record so um i need to perform a recording so yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. so reInvent re is coming up and that should be fun and we're all looking forward to it it's it, and and here a reInvent for us is the busiest time of the year like it's just mm. um we are just completely swamped with things um basically doing nothing <laughs> it's not just preparing for reInvent so yeah um fun times <laughs> Uh, but speaking of, of big things uh the topic of today is um um is going to be something that I don't like to focus on a specific uh, like technology per se, but this is a very important underlying technology that we all um, use on AWS, that we all need to, not just on AWS, we use everywhere, right? Um, so um, let's talk about storage. Um, and like in the past, when I was a young system admin, we had storage admins. We had folks who were just storage administrators, people who would manage their, our big old SAN and NAS um, uh, devices and whatnot. Um, so, oh, are you going to bring us some SAN or NAS? Okay, cool. Gobus, uh, you need some props. There we go. Um, Waffles, I am going to be doing in DevOps. So my, my talk is in DevOps. It's called test twice, deploy once. Um, it's testing infrastructure code. So do check it out. Um, <clears throat> what did you bring us, Gobus? Drives. Drives. This is two, four, six. This is one of three piles of hard drives I still have to work through. And you can see here, ah, yeah, they're actually quite heavy. It's They've got those nice little, I've got HP microservice. So these are the ones that I cleaned out and need to clean up properly. Um, okay, so let me let me ask the audience. Uh, everybody in the audience, um, and I know some of you know it, but um, I'm going to try to show you something. And uh, let's see, let, let's guess your age. What is this? Don't say it, Kobus. I know what it is. Uh, waffles, floppy, Viva, AZ, floppy. Hmm. Floppy. Bigger, 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 bigger. It's a zip disk. <laughs> Does anybody know what a zip disk is? <laughs> yes. They were. 
<laughs> Going to take the, the world across or over, so, yeah. So um, I I have a bunch of zip disks, or actually, I so okay. This is a this is a thing to show. This oh, is yes. an iOmega. Oh, actually, this is an iOmega zip drive. So let me move away. Can this thing? Yes. So this um, this used to be the thing. So back in this is from 1999. Um, you would get um, back in 1999, like. CD burners were not a thing. Like a CD burner was expensive. Oh, no. uh, it was just ridiculous. Um, mm. You had floppy disks, which we all know and love. Uh, but on a floppy disk, you can get one point um, four four megabytes on, right? Um, on this thing, you can get one hundred megabytes. So uh, it 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 functions very similar to a floppy disk. There's a magnet, um, like a magnetic disk inside. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, they are like, I never had these as a kid. Like this would be the, the thing for me back in even 2003. So, uh, <laughs> um, these things are, you know, a hundred megabytes, uh, DOS formatted <laughs> iOmega zip drives. And I'm so sad that the, these things didn't catch on. Like I, I would mm -hmm. love it if no, there was no, like no. a 32 gigabyte version of this one. Memory stick. <laughs> But no, 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 no. Yeah. What is this? I'm not showing the front because then you can see it. Let me just get it from my face. Okay, I'll, I'll let it's the folks. Not... I'll, I'll let the folks reply. I know what it is. I'll I give you a hint. It's not an SD card. Uh -huh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's see. I'll okay. give you a hint. This this specific one is 256 megs. I'll be back in a second. I need to get. I need to get more storage formats. Oh yeah. No, no. Uh, yes, Totem Telecom, congratulations, you are right. This is the first version of the Sony Memory Stick, the Stick Pro, uh, in this case, it's nice blue in the front. And this is the second generation, the, the, what's it, the, uh, Stick Pro Duo Magic Gate Mark II. Uh, this one's four gigs. This is not an SD card. This is a proprietary Sony one. So, yes. Memory six Memory Stick. Uh, yeah, Sony, and uh -huh. Sony still sell those things. Sony still has memory yeah. sticks. It's weird. Yeah. Sony has this thing where it, it wants pr uh, pr uh, proprietary data. So yeah, um, <laughs> it is uh, one of the things like I'm missing. Uh, and this was a discussion I had with uh, with uh, somebody on, on 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 Twitter yesterday is um, mm -hmm. um, Bernoulli discs. Bernoulli discs use the Bernoulli principle. It, they, it, oh. they were they were very similar to CDs. Like so, they came in a caddy, and you couldn't remove them from a caddy. If you basically just hit them on something, they would go away. They would die. Like the, it, it was horrible, oh, wow. horribly fragile, and they could store like hundred megs. Um, but you can write on them, right? But somebody mentioned here, um, uh, uh, green coat. Yeah, um, mm. zip is cool. But have you ever heard of uh, data cassette types? Oh, buddy, <laughs> I have a collection oh, of yes. these things. There um, we yeah. go. So, um, oh, and hey kids, I used to um, think you could you could copy those with a normal hi-fi. Um, well, because you I can. Didn't know. You can. So the old ones. Um, so this is just audio. Uh, in essence, this is uh, Lunar Jetman. I have also Jetpack and whatnot. Um, basically, these games uh, are just audio files. And um, if you want to play like uh, old games on an old ZX Spectrum, which uses tapes uh, like this, you can plug in. Um, just uh, up your phone, and you mm. can basically just attach the audio uh, cable of your phone if you have one <laughs> uh, to the to the to the ZX Spectrum, and it would just oh, load the game wow. off an audio file. And I used to live, you know, I in Serbia. See that. Yeah, in, I lived in Serbia, and in the eighties or late eighties, um, there were some uh, radio stations in Yugoslavia back then uh, that would in the in the evening that would announce that they are uh, broadcasting a game. So what they did in the evening, they would basically have a slot of an hour where they would spend like 10 minutes um, during that hour of broadcasting a game over radio. <laughs> they will tell you and you would hit the record button and just hope somebody doesn't come into the room or you get interference because you can record oh, a game wow. off the radio to a tape. <laughs> <laughs> I would and, love to look at the tech because it, it, remember we're talking zeros and one digital information and I know analog yeah. has got some loss and things to it so it'd be very interesting to see how it actually stored it um, and do you know what this wow. is yes <laughs> is it a, the question is is it a BASF no it's, it's not. not oh it's actual it's original it's uh, yeah I need it's to get uh, me some of those yeah 
It's a uh, it's the actually, it's, uh, it's the old three D printed uh, save button. Yeah. So I actually preferred yeah. floppies to stiffies. The reason is that the the floppies because they were bigger, they were one point two yeah. mega if I remember correctly, and the stiffies one point four four. Um, they were less likely to break. The, the yeah, floppies this, you really yeah. had to punish it before you lost data on it. Exactly. Um, but the stiffy drives, I mean, you just sneeze on it and it broke. Exactly. Um, exactly. Well, not that bad, but yeah. Yeah. These these things were indestructible at home. Uh, I don't have it here, but at home in Serbia, I have an eight inch. A five and a, uh, eighteen floppy disk. It's basically just this much more. So it, it is. It is. It is big. Um, uh, uh, I have. I have also like a tape from an old computer as well, like the big old tape that goes into computers. Oh yeah. So uh, <clears throat> data formats. Um, of course, none of these things work. Wait, 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 wait. Just one more thing that's super cool. Have you seen the modern robot arm operated data caves effectively? Oh yes. The the uh, you mean the the tape things. The uh, yes, uh, uh, the trim. Well, I don't know what they're called, but I mean, let me see if I can find a quick photo of it for us to put up here. But it's like I saw that I went like that is the future. Um, okay. Uh, data tape cave robots. I think it's called the data tape uh, images. Uh, data tape. Okay, it's not a cave. I might be exaggerating with the cave part. Uh, but it is one of those IBM, uh, or it doesn't have to be IBM, but the Altrium ones. I I, I use the Altrium, yeah. which is like uh, the big old um, screen, that one. backup. Yeah, so I'm just basically, <laughs> if you just search for it, you can see. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, definitely. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yeah, I've got my S3 bucket. Yeah. Kobus, when are we going to get a bucket and just write S3 on it? Okay, next prop. We need a bucket with S3 on it. Okay. I've got many <laughs> buckets. I just need to make sure it's an S3 bucket. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Now, yeah. And, and, and to oh, be honest, there we go. This is the one. This is the one I saw way yeah. back. With, it has to have the red light. Otherwise, it's not a proper robot. <laughs> Sorry. Requirement. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is. And no, this, the plans of the list aren't in there, in case you're wondering. Wow. Well, I mean, I mean so and, and, and let's be honest, like even today, I think um, the, the density of storage you can get on, on, on Altrium um, or actually the, on the on the on the tapes is is high. Like you're going to get 100 gig, uh, well, uh, one terabyte or a bit more on a tape for relatively low money. And for long term mm. storage, that's just that's yeah. just great right so uh i i do i did used to manage a backup system back in the day um uh, which consisted of a of a big old box in a rack with like 24 discs i believe uh, of 24 tapes there was a robotic arms inside who would just exchange those mm. tapes so so it is it is it is very cool but yeah i see a lot of people are excited with the stuff we showed on screen um oh yeah anything else which is exotic i'm wondering but, um, so yeah, Here's a fun one, just uh, not many people realize this back in the day, is that when you used uh, CDs and DVDs to actually back up data, yeah. a CD only had like a life cycle of about 10 years. Yeah, um, exactly. Especially the rift, because, because, yeah, because the film is obviously stuck to it, um, and that would actually go off after a while and actually break. So it's like DVDs and CDs are not long-term storage if you're writing to them. That's why you still see nowadays, often you've got some kind of uh, service that'll come pick up the tape drive in a nice little Pelican case and then take it off-site and then rotate it back um, at some point because it really is that important to store it off-site in something that can actually last a long, long time. Um, what have you got there, Darko? Uh, it's, uh, it's also proprietary data format. Uh, somebody mentioned it in chat, uh, but I, I decided I want to show it. So this is this this looks very futuristic. This is like straight out, straight out of, I don't know. It's uh oh yes oh John and Mnemonic there we go that's where it's, it's from yeah this is an UMD or Universal Media Disc of course it's from Sony because Sony mm. um yeah this is this that is what you first what PSP. used to it's for a PSP yeah this is what yeah. used to go mm. into your like uh, PSP games um so mm. yeah it's it's weird it's like it's just a CD it, it, the essence is it's a CD there's no there is no different technology in it than a, just a normal compact disc it's just small and it's in a, in, the, in, a, in a plastic caddy so. Mm. But uh, yeah, um, storage has changed over the years, and as you can see uh, through our Slightly. lovely, <laughs> yeah, through our yeah, lovely, I mean, wait, wait. Um, uh, yeah, I'm I almost drop uh, that screen some more. Here we go. Even this is outdated. 
Aha, uh -huh. okay, disk. Uh, okay, yeah, exactly. So SATA disks are also like quote unquote outdated. It's they're getting old. I mean, there's faster ways mm -hmm. of doing like NVMe storage is is getting mm -hmm. faster. And and it, like, I bought myself two uh, two hundred and fifty gigabyte SSDs yesterday for twenty five euros each. So I paid I paid a bit over a euro per gigabyte, which is nothing. I mean, they're not amazing SSDs. Mm -hmm. They're SSDs which are just um um. There, there's, I think they're DRAM-less or something like that, so they're slow. But I, you, I bought buy those things because I have a lot of operating systems. I kind of tend to switch over, so I just <laughs> I install something on it, put a label on it, and let, let it go. Yeah. So yeah. More importantly, you've got that front um, loading front, drive yeah. bay. Yeah, exactly. That I'm so jealous of. It's <laughs> so, especially is it is it two three and a half inches or is it one three and a half inch? Bay? It's uh, five and a quarter. Oh, inch, sorry, like, five, five and a quarter. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, yeah, so I, the, I can. The, I can I can stick four four discs into these things. So basically, just put yeah. a disc inside, and you just slide it in. Whoa, bam! And it oh, works. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's good. Oh, Geo uh, DMB. Yes, the the Samsung Evos are awesome. I actually have the in this machine. I've got the nine. I, th I think it's nine sixty. Um, they are holy crap. They're fast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's just like you can see the difference between a normal because I went from obviously I, I switched the SSDs for work machines in about 2010 I think I got my yeah. first one and I've never not worked on SSD since then and I could see the difference between an SSD and the NVE yeah. ones it's like die it is it is it's much better because you you connect it directly to the PCI bus so it's it's, mm. it's you know you can get especially now with PCI Gen 4 you can get like up to four four gigabytes of a second or three and a half gigabytes a second or five gigabytes a second or something like that ridiculous mm. yeah <laughs> uh, see dennis has bought shenzhen io shenzhen io is a wonderful game uh, it's it's worth uh yeah a uh, green code uh do uh, if you have if you can if you can try nvme try it i mean your motherboard needs to have an nvme slot um uh, it is much faster. Uh, it's just a small disk like this. It's it's just great. I mean, um, mm -hmm. modern modern laptops have like three or four NVMe slots now, so you can have yeah. multiple disks in a laptop. So amazing. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, but so speaking of storage, um, you've seen a lot of um, a lot of a lot of things change throughout the years. You know, we went from floppy oh, disks yeah. to well, from actually proper floppy disks to the uh, one point one point four for floppy disk, the, the bigger ones, and then tape drives, and you know. You can, you can in essence store like two hundred kilobytes of data on this one, depending on how it's formatted. Then you can store like seven hundred kilobytes or one point two megs on the floppy disk, the big floppy disk. Mm. You can store one point four four megabytes on a bigger flo on, on the on the one point uh, um, no three and a half inch for, uh, floppy disk, and then mm. you can get a hundred megs on this thing. Here's the thing: Ex uh, storage was always important. Storage was never less important. There was never a point in time where like, hey, no, storage is not that important right now. Storage was always equally as important. And due to the fact that storage abundance has changed quite a lot in the last 20, 30 years, um, the way we do compute, the way we do things on the cloud are mm -hmm. different. And Kobus, I believe you, you've spoken about this uh, last week or this week about why did we start using NoSQL databases? databases? Yes. Yep. I mean, it's, it's basically the bottleneck. I mean, when databases, so a lot of people think like NoSQL, oh, it's a new thing, it's in the 2000s. It's like, nope, nope, nope. Uh, go read up on the research from the 1970s. Funny enough, like a lot of all the core concepts came from then when they actually really sat down and thought about it. And the reason relational was used in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was that storage was incredibly expensive. Correct. And relational is the most efficient way to store the data because when we've got columns, you try and normalize them into the specific units of data and have the row per table as full as possible. Yes, you can have nullable columns. Um, I think that only came later. Yeah. Um, so the idea is to use as little space per thing or other spend compute cycle joining things together to build out the data that you want. Um, and then obviously what happened is in 2000s, storage was already not as restricted, but what really exploded was effectively the cloud. It's yeah. being able to have pretty much infinite compute resources and infinite storage. Now it's like, how do I go about building the best database with this infrastructure? And also the characteristics are different because it's no longer a single server. Um, you've got multiple servers, so you've got a distributed system. So cap theorem kicks in, what's the trade-off? And that's always fun because cap theorem is consistency, availability, and partitioning. And with cloud, there will always be, or any distributed system, there will always be partitioning. So you yep. choose between consistency or availability. And those are the two choices you have to make. Correct, correct. And, and you know, in the modern world of the cloud, 
we have so much storage out there. Like, I don't think there's a, there's a, there's like a people like, especially not cloud native companies don't think of about storage as like, oh, we're going to run out of storage, right? Storage is there, right? You have basically unlimited amount of storage uh, or mm. practically unlimited amount of storage on, on, on AWS. Now the, the, the thing where, where it comes here is the cost, of course. So, so this is why it's still, even in this modern day and age. And, and I think, I think this also, okay. So I need to take a step back, uh, before the cloud, we had local storage on, on servers, right? Like you had physical servers sitting in your data center, which had local disks, you know, built into them. That's fine. Then you had a NAS unit, like a network attached storage or a storage array network, SAN, storage array network. Yeah. Um, you had NAS and mm. SAN units, um, which would basically serve as the, as the central storage hub inside of your um, company. And you would basically try to balance things out between, okay, um, uh, I have some fa super fast storage. I'm going to write on disks, on, uh, and then I have something else that can be slower. It can running on a NAS because it can it can take take the network overhead. Then for something in the between, I can use the NAS, the SAN unit because I will connect the blocks directly to mm. my servers. Blah 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 over fiber channel. That's all fine. Um, then we moved to the cloud, and everything is like okay, it's storage. Just, just, just go. <laughs> we have so much yeah, storage what, on there. What, just, what do you want? Yeah. Exactly. But and it's I mean, very important. Even, it's very important also to 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 be efficient with storage in the cloud we mm. like especially when it comes to s3 like people think like oh just just dump stuff on s3 there's many different ways to dump stuff on s3 uh um <laughs> and big, it can save you a lot of money right <laughs> this is where the problem comes in right yeah what i was going to say is with the storage the other thing that it's uh, that's slowly going away is that you no longer have to worry about the different raid levels um because yes. <laughs> That used to be like a massive thing. And also, especially if you've done dealt with SANS and things, then that becomes a really interesting discussion because at home, I've got a little Linux server that I use for local backups. Um, um, two things I learned. One um, is that if you are building your own RAID setup, do not use drives from the same batch. Go buy yeah. different brands and different types, or at least from different timestamps, because guess what? If they fail after X amount of time, they're likely to fail in the same small window roughly because of manufacturing defects and guess what happens if you've got raid five um so that's where i learned about raid six the first yeah. time um and then mixing things up and the second thing i learned is that when i went from one terabyte drives uh, four of them in a raid five array to four four terabyte drives in a raid five array okay what was the challenge there darko hmm can you say that again how much many how much drives so four four terabyte drives okay. in raid five okay so ultimately, twelve terabyte volume. Exactly. Yeah, but if it's RAID yeah. five, you lose amount of data. The one is a parity disk, right? Yeah, that's fine. That's that. That's not the challenge. The challenge I'll give you a hint is time. Oh, replication. Yes, and rebuilding the array. It rebuilding takes so array. long. Yeah, yeah. We're taking talking five six days to rebuild the uh, the drive. I mean, it's insane. And also, <laughs> then the fun part comes in statistics starts counting in your um um. Uh, uh, in your uh, against you because statistically there are chances that it makes does a miswrite of data yeah. and now you because you're writing so much so there's a certain point where raid starts becoming more likely to break than work yeah. um so change just quickly with raid five that's the one where one drive is dedicated well not just one drive but a uh, n out, one out of the n number of volumes is um used for parity so they stripe yeah. the parity across all the different drives so you've got let's say data block a b c and then parity is on drive d and the next right. one is let's say a b parity on c data on d they yeah. stripe it across all the different drives but effectively you, you lose one disk out of the, one disk, yeah. the bunch yeah so rate five is very optimal when it comes to um uh, data um persistent uh, data persistency or concurrent is that the word? Yeah. Redundancy. Redundancy. Yeah. Redundancy yes. and the data storage, right? So you get, mm. it's not like mirroring where you have to have two disks. Um, um, basically you lose 50% of your storage on um, mm. RAID 1 or 0. I always mix it through. Is it RAID 1 or 0? Uh, one, 1 is mirroring, 0 is striping. Striping, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. when you do RAID 1 or mirroring, you lose 50% of your storage, right? Mm. Um, when it comes to uh, RAID 5, you use just a small percentage. But there's also like a multiple different, you can do RAID 10. Uh, I've seen RAID 10 being implemented. Uh, so <laughs> I have to put this up here. RAID <laughs> right. 0 is, oh God, why do, do we do this? Um, because you wanted speed. So just for those not familiar with the RAID 0 is I've got two disks. And what yeah. I do is I write a part of the data over here and a part of the data over here. So if any drive goes, and you can remember yeah. there's no limit. Well, there's 
obviously some limits in terms of how many you can put in space, but you could put 10 of them in RAID 0. You get a blazingly fast drive, but yeah. if one drive goes, everything is gone. I've, yeah. I've seen people implement like four disk RAID 0 arrays in their own desktop PCs for like, oh, I want to be super fast. And it was back in the day where we didn't have SSDs. We had like, mm. uh, the fastest thing you can get was like a a, a Raptor. Um, I think it was a Western Digital oh, Raptor. Oh, Western Digital Raptors. 10,000 10, RPM. RPM. 10,000 RPM, yeah. Uh, was it 10, 12. not 12? Maybe 12. Well, it was 12. 12. Yeah. There yeah. was a 12. It was a 12. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, and you would have these like massive arrays, which were just like hum during execution. Um, but it, you, you lose one drive and you... You're gone, and you have yeah. four. Like I think I'm, I'm. I'm not sure about math, but I think it's four times the likeliness of it failing because you have four discs, and statistically, one of them is gonna fail. So yep. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So there is a mix screen code. There is. So there's a mix. So you can. Uh, one of the most common mixes is mixing RAID zero and RAID one. So what you do is yeah. picture four drives in a two by two grid, and then you either have um, a, a stripe, so RAID zero, and then you mirror that whole partition as is, or you've got uh, two drives that are mirrored, and then you've got uh, stripe them across the two different drives. It's like, it depends how you configure it, but basically it's, you combine the two, and then you've got half the space of the total number of drives, but you've got uh, four times the read speed and two yeah. times the write speed of a single drive. Uh, is Because the baseline is, you, you pick the different RAID characteristics based, based on what performance you want. For example, RAID 5 focuses on um, Redundancies because it keeps a parity, but it means that you the maximum write speed is um, uh, n minus one of the total number of disks because it spreads the write across the disks. With the caveat, if it's writing across all four, if it's too small, it'll only write one disk. Yeah. Um, um, and the read speed is obviously also uh, n minus one in terms of the number of ones because you're reading from multiple sources at the same time. Yeah. Um, RAID six is RAID five with a secondary parity disk, so you get n minus two in terms of all the values. Um, so yeah. But so so and also like a lot of people on, so on AWS right. If you use an EC2 instance, you don't care about RAID. You shouldn't. Oh uh, no, you do. Well, you do. You can set up. That's what I was kind of bringing it. You can set up RAID on on EC2 absolutely. But in most use cases, it should be fine, right? Um, I've I've never seen a big massive push for RAID usage. Uh, there's a way you can do it on EC2, right? Let's actually. I, I want to check this out. Let me spin up. Pin up. Well, I, I've I never can tell done. you. I've done it. Okay. I've done it, and after this, let me open up. Let me open up my, my my EC2 console, and uh, I am gonna I'm gonna do that, and mm. you can you can guide me through it because I've never set up RAID on EC2. I've had people ask me about it, uh, but I've never uh, did it myself. So so let's cover the why first before okay, the how. Yeah. Uh, the why is because remember an EBS volume is a volume that's attached over the network, which means there is a latency associated with it, and yes. that latency does have a minimum and a maximum threshold so some applications you want to be able to know what that threshold what that value is and narrow it down to be a smaller band of minimum and maximum values and then by having multiple ebs volumes that you stripe across um you can actually average them better it's because the other the bottom bit comes uh, up a little bit and the top bit comes down a bit because you're now spread across all of these different ones right. um so let's, but let's, i think let's, with uh, iops yeah, yeah exactly. with the, the IO one, the, the, the what do you call it, the IO one and the IO two. Yeah, the provision um, ones. Was, yeah, it was IO two that came out recently, or was it? G, no, yeah, it's IO two. I think that came out recently. Let's have a look. Um, I'm gonna do. Let's do something larger. Yeah, just go micro. Um, micro. Let's do T three because we're modern. Um, T three micro. Um, instance details. This should be fine. Um, I'm gonna give it a roll it's, because why not? Um. Is that how you're gonna roll? I'm gonna roll. Uh, there's nothing here to enable for a raid. No, 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 no. You have to do it on the operating system level. Ah. So okay, okay, MD80. okay, okay. Yeah. Mm, ah. MDADM is your friend. MD. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Got it, got it. Mm. So let me add a new one. I'm gonna do thirty. I mean, um, I can show you quick. Uh, is this still big enough? Yes. Jesus, big. Sorry. This is now. Uh, going from a 20 inch to a 27 inch, um, my text is huge. Uh... Ooh, where I, I don't even recall which. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, barcode F this oh, I forgot which which region am I watching in this one. Jesus. Okay, I guess this one should okay, work. Um, um, this one should work. Launch key pair. 
US one, yes. Knowledge launch. I, the key does pay that does key pay doesn't matter. I think it's gonna I can exit through Citizens Manager anyway. So, um, mm. yeah. Let's have a look. Yeah. So once they're up, you're gonna use MD ADM. There are obviously other ways you can do it as well to um, as set up the Stripe cluster. Yeah. Um, like actually, you can you can can you set up LVM on this one? Like that was my point. Like you can use LVM as well or logical volume management yeah. to kind of make a software raid mm. out of this one. So. Um, Session manager, connect. Now you're just showing off. <laughs> oh, the new feature when it comes to session manager, you can actually de define which um, which um, shell you want to use Terminal. on start. Oh, yeah. oh nice. Mm, yeah. So, um, cool. Um, MD, ADM. Uh, AMD, yep. ADM. Okay. Yeah, let's so now okay. we can use you. I have... Okay, I have two disks. Yeah. This zero one is being used for my root. How do I set up mm. RAID, Kovis? Uh, what you do is you, f with MDADM, you define a new um, partition. And I can actually, let me just quickly open up. I, I, I'll show us, uh, I'll just share my screen in a second uh, because guess what? I cannot tell you how to do this, but I used to know how to do this. And I have got a very old blog post on this. Okay. Okay. The last time I had to work on it. Uh, cluster, no. Create. Uh, older, wait, 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 wait. Older. You must be rude. Okay. Sudo, su. Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> okay. My uh, whip, uh, what do you call it? Is broken. My uh, blog, actually, it seems. Your what? My blog is broken. I can't go to the older pages. Your I'll need to fix this. Is broken. Ooh. Just remember the one we moved to uh, Amplify? <laughs> we apparently successfully moved it. <laughs> wow. Well now, son. Well. Oh, man. <laughs> that's fine. There's another. Luckily, it's, it's publicly on, available on GitHub as well. So I can just go in there. Uh, let me just get the repository. This is hilarious to me, by the way. Um, <laughs> Testing code. Quibus. <laughs> uh, uh, there we go. Uh, posts. There we go. Um, multi accounts. Uh, MDA replace drive. What? See if I Maybe it might be this. Let's have a look quick. So uh, when are we gonna be making? Uh, when are we gonna be making raid arrays from zip disks? <laughs> Raspberry Pis with uh, you, Ceph or you can, other you, can, you can daisy chain multiple of these. <laughs> that just sounds like a terrible idea, Darko. Yeah. By the way, these things use parallel parallel cables. If for all the kids out there, this was the, the the thing. This was the fastest way you can get data across things back in the day before USB. So, <laughs> I think uh, even during USB, this was at one point faster. Um, uh, uh, I think, I mean, compared to serial connection, this was much faster, but I think even compared to USB, uh, USB 1.0, it was faster. Okay. I may be wrong. Let me pop my screen up quickly. Give me a Do. second. Here we go. Right. So this is from, you can see the GitHub repo there at the okay. top if you go dig into it. Mm -hmm. But basically, you run the command that says, uh, this command over here, which is where you create the okay. RAID level, you just specify the devices and all that. Um, but can I, can, I do it, can I do it within the root volume as well? No, because no. Mm -hmm. you, the reason is you need to be able to boot off it. And there are ways that you can compile MD ADM into the actual kernel. Mm -hmm. Because remember, if it's not in the kernel, right. it can't actually load that module to make use of the, and it needs to be able to read it. So that's, you kind of run into that headache. So the way I got around that way back in the day was just setting up RAID 1 to Stripe, or sorry, not to Stripe, to mirror the boot right. partition across multiple drives. Okay. Effectively, it didn't boot off that as a RAID pad partition. But okay. because it ran afterwards, it actually kept it in sync. So if something happened to the disk, I would just boot from one of the other ones uh, it, and actually do that. But I mean, that's basically how you set it up. Um, the other nice thing, and this is what I did in this article, is that I set up a mail rule that actually sends me an email if something goes wrong with one of the okay. drives. Because the first time that caught me off guard is like your your red ray goes into a degraded state, but it still works. And you don't know that it's broken until a second drive fails and everything is gone. Right, Ask me how right. I learned that. <laughs> um, and I mean, what that looks like is if you look, so this is the, uh, let me just clean this up quickly. There you can see my current setup over here is I've got, um, that, oh, well, so on this one is HDC. Oh man. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the other server is the one that I nuked the other day. On that one, the SD card is SDB. On this one, which is the same type of server, just with slightly different configuration in yeah. terms of the CPU, it's SDC. So don't ask me why the hell this is the case. Because this... <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Um, so what you can see is that's the SD card and it's the um, A, B, S, D, and E are the actual um, individual uh, ah, physical okay, drives. Okay. So you can see okay, I create, okay. you create a partition on there, use the partition to mount. Um, and then if you go um, uh, proc MD okay. stack, you can see that it's uh, currently up. And the, the important part of here being those use. Mm -hmm. You will learn to dread if you see an underscore in there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, so I, I, the only thing I've worked with uh, when it comes to software raids, I, I work with LVM or Logical Volume, volume Manager. Um, it's, mm. it's basically the same thing. Well, it's very similar, I guess. Um, I, I, I don't think you, well, so no, it's not. So LVM, you cannot, it's only striping. Um, you cannot, uh, or it's, it's, it's a combination of things. But I don't think you yeah. can do like mirroring on, on uh, you can have multiple physical disks and you can span mm. uh, single volumes across multiple disks. Now, how does it actually all work? I, I use LVM because it's easy to backup LVM. Like I use LVM on my laptop because I can just backup LVM partitions easily. Um, just mm. as a snapshot, I can do LVM snapshots. So that's that's really pretty yeah. cool. Uh, but yeah. Um, so, but I would love, I, I need to figure out the MD, MD admin. I, I, I want to play with this. I mean, um, never, mm, never did that's... it, uh, but would like to see that thing. So um, here's the fun part. If I remember correctly, when I did this fix is when I set up, um, where did that window go? Uh, when I set up uh, my the four terabyte one, so this article is from 2016. So I believe that I've been running that MD ADM volume since 2016, Whoa. 2017, sometime. Yeah, that's um, very cool. That's very cool. yeah, nice. Mm. I mean, I mean, it, it just works, right? That's the thing. That's the whole point. It it works once you set it up. If if follow the article till the end because it'll okay. tell you how to do a replacement drive, and there should be a link somewhere here to the. Um, there we go. Notifications for future failures. Mm, okay. Super important that part. I did rebuild. Um, I, I, I don't think it was MD, MDADM, but oh, it was. It was a long. Wow, buddy, you. My first sysadmin job. I had two Linux servers to manage, uh, and they had four disks inside. And I was doing something. Like, I remember watching that screen, um, the, the 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 health of the of the of the of the array oh, yeah. or whatever. Um, I remember watching that, and I didn't know what that meant. Like I, I know that the, the other system told me like if this shows bad, you need to run this command, and that's about what I knew. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> monkey see, uh, monkey do. Follow the play. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But uh, there's a few questions here. Uh, um, there's a from. Uh, uh, Mithens the Killer Bunny. Mm. Um, do you guys feel that, that there is going to be a surge in storage tech, hardware, and software, uh, given the stateless services uh, being widely adopted? Um, mm. No. It's, I don't think it's going to be a surge in, in all of those things, right? Um, mm. Storage is still extensively used. Uh, and no matter what you're doing, like stateless uh, services, you still need uh, a right ton of storage. Yeah, yeah. So that data is still being stored somewhere. Now, the, the only difference mm. here is it's being abstracted. And so it's not you're not using file access storage or disk access storage. You're using um, object access storage, and you know you still have to have objects somewhere. Um, and I think the, just the just the way we interact with things are going to be much mm. different. The way you interact with storage is gonna is gonna be different, and it is different as, as things go along, right? So, you know, I mean, accessing things from to... a file system is. Mm. Well, being able to mount storage as a file system is the big one because if you think uh, with uh, virtual machine EC2 instances, you can have an EBS volume, you can mount yeah. the EFS mount if you want to do a shared network storage. Obviously, the EFS share is slower than the EBS one in terms of, well, caveat depends on how you configure things, but generally speaking, it's slower than EBS because of the way you access it. And you can now even mount that EFS volume inside individual containers. So as right. um, on EKS or ECS, um, and that's where the big benefit comes in. It's like you can mount the storage and access it, share it, it's persisted properly. The challenge is some people want to use um, the uh, container orchestrator to also launch their databases. Yeah. Um, and that to me feels like a bit of a step backwards because yes, you're running it on your cluster or and you're not you know inside a specific cloud vendor's database service which lock in. Um, but it's so much slower, so much more complicated. It's like no. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I'm it, very it, against that. It, you're yeah. going to bump your head and you're going to lose data. 
Um, I, I I agree. I agree. And also, like, uh, there's there's folks out there, and and this is uh, people ask this, and there are solutions for that. Is hosting or uh, actually uh, mounting S3 as a file system? You mm-hmm. can do that. There's S3 fuse and all that stuff, but it is by no means good. Like, don't do, do, no, don't depend on it because. F- S3 is not a file system. It's uh, okay. So when I was when I was when I was in pre- exactly yeah well, that's it. Yeah. And I, when I was in premium support, I was doing like these kind of introductory explanations to new support engineers of what is AWS and kind of things. So when I would explain storage options, and back then we had EFS, EBS, and S3, right, the main ones. So I would explain to them like your um, your EBS is like your your SAN unit. You have a array of disks which are connected. Uh, as volumes, as block devices to your server, servers throughout the network, right? Your EFS is your NAS. It's the thing that you access over the TCP stack. You have to access it through the network. Uh, you have the network overhead on it. Um, it's great. It's it's still a file system, but you access it um, as a file system through network, through a, as a network file system, actually. And then you have S3, and S3 is like if you had API access to your Dropbox, Basically, that you can just uh, you need to make API calls to write and read things mm. from S3. So that's the that's the main difference between these things. So, and and this is and that's how you should treat them. That's how you should treat these things. Ideally, if your application can work perfectly with S3 storage, with object storage, that's the most optimal way to go. In a sense, in in a, in a cost, a performance, and reliability sense, because. On S3, you really don't have to worry about any MDADM, any RAID, anything going bad, snapshots, not snapshots, mm. no. Just, it exists. There's 11 nines of reliability. Uh, reliability or resiliency? Redundancy. Redu- okay, um, one, of, one of those things. <laughs> um, Google. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, S3 is one of the one of the most one of one of the most resilient, reliant, or or, or um, something else. Um, the services out there. It's mm. we, we like to boast with it that it has eleven nines, and to uh, do uh, do eleven nines is a is a durability. Yes, not strategy. Thank you. It's in durability. The data durability. Mm. So that means it will lose. Um, it will lose only a couple of kilobytes per I don't know how many um, terabytes or petabytes like- of data. So. Mm. It, it is massive. So um, th- this is where S3 kind of removes all the nonsense of managing storage for you. But again, not everything can be done through S3. And that's the main point. Do not try to shoehorn S3 into your application by mounting it as a file system or something like that because... <laughs> I need a hammer and a square pole with a round peg. Exactly. As a <laughs> you can do it. That's the thing. You can use S3 as a file system but you shouldn't. You should absolutely not do it unless you're using it exclusively for just uploading random files, which is not important. Mm. Or, you know, like just backing up stuff. Of course, that that would work. But even then, just use API calls rather than a file system. Mm. So, I was actually thinking, a fun thing now is just um, who in the audience has actually not seen the inside of a normal spinning rust, um, like spinning drive? Um, has there been anybody? Because I might actually have one year or I definitely have like a broken drive or two. I can quickly dismantle if we want. I played music through a drive once. You know that if you if you open it up uh, and mm-hmm. there's two uh, on the on the arm, there's two connections for that motor. Um, you can actually connect your speakers. Like you can connect the, oh, actually oh, you wow. can connect the output of of, a, of an audio device and um, connect those things and the the speaker mm. the, the, it will vibrate enough that you hear huss, hear music. Mm. It's it's horrible, but you can hear it. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. The other the other thing with drives, the interesting thing, let me see. Actually, see, I might have different ones. I want to show you because the number of platters inside a disk is actually different. Yep. Um, ah, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You can. Sorry. Yeah. You can see it. So these are both CK drives, but I've put them side by side. You can actually see do that way that the one is uh, a bit higher than the yep. other one. Um, because inside these disks, they actually have different number of platters. And that's also, especially when the newer higher density ones came out, you always want to check how many platters they had in because more platters means more chance of something failing. So the less platters means that there's, it runs cooler, it's less likely yeah. to break. Oh, wow, this is a this is an 80 gig drive still from, I don't know how long ago. This is a 200 gig drive. I have I have one of those I have one of those if you remember Cobus that um, like those uh, the, the the laptop size drives that two and a half inch they're usually thinner, but I have a two terabyte version of a of a of a laptop drive. It's much much chunkier, like it's thick. Uh, yeah, so 
It is. <laughs> Uh, this has been strolled through memory lane of storage, I guess. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I mean, so here I've got, this is a 750 gig one. Uh, 500 gig, 500 gig, and 320 gig. You need to back up all that data, man. <laughs> I do, I do. I've got a toy here. Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the camera goes away. <laughs> Hello, Cobas, sidewide Cobas. Sideways covers. That's what happens when you put too much crap on your desk. And yes, it's still skew, I know. Um, and something like a box or something now fell off onto the cable or the camera behind the scenes. So give me a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you not entertained? <laughs> oh, man. Ah, oh, yes. One of those things. Is it all SATA? Yeah. It's, oh, oh, you have an ID. Oh, awesome. Uh, uh, awesome. Awesome. That's cool. Yeah, it's got the old ports as well. Yeah, so uh, I ordered so today. Uh, today I ordered um, um, an ID to SATA conversion kit, so that you can mm. connect SATA disks to an ID uh, ID thing. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun. I can wait. Let me get my little so, furry animal. Oh, this little furry animal. Oh, it makes me happy. He's just like <laughs> so soft. So soft. Yeah, those things are very good, yeah. especially on the on the wind. Um, so, uh, mittens the killer bunny. <laughs> yeah, we keep working. Uh, we keep working data, uh, set data on premises, but for persistence, we mix and heavily use AWS for long term. It's awesome mm. seeing services we move from VMs to containers to stop spooling heavily local and no longer have. Yeah, exactly. So, mm. um, and and this is one of the one of the common use cases of customers on AWS. They um, move things to the cloud for persistence because you have <laughs> a very persistent storage on AWS, right? Uh, um, and, and and even if you're slowly migrating off the on premises to the cloud, that's just one of the first things you can do, right? Just just move off some storage. Mm. And I keep all of my personal backups on S3, right? It's um, it's roughly the same price as you would use like um, uh, like one of those Dropboxes or Google. I think it's a bit cheaper than Dropbox. Um, now, if you're using something like Glacier, so there's okay, we haven't gotten into this. So Amazon S3 is our object-based storage where you store, store files. Mm. But there's multiple different tiers of storage. There's the standard one. There's the single AZ one. There's the um, infrequent access. There's Glacier and there's Deep Glacier. And as you go down the down that path, they get the storage gets cheaper, right? So for in essence, in Glacier you can uh, store one terabyte of data data for a dollar a month or something like that, or even even less. So it is, it is, it can, it can, there we go. Okay, cool. So <laughs> this is, this is the different types of tiers. And this is where you have uh, durability. Mm. Yes, there we go. Uh, we can see the 11 lines of durability of data. Mm. Um, and, and, and the price here goes in. The, 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 when it comes to uh, Glacier and Gla Glacier Deep Archive, those are, sep those are, those are very specific things. And <laughs> those things you need to be counting on uh, when it comes to um, using them because to get the data back from Glacier, uh, it takes time. So it's not like, yeah. let me pull my things out of a Glacier. It takes minutes, hours, or well, some amount of time to get it. So it's something I think that up you, to 12 you, hours. Yeah, yeah. Deep Glacier is up to 12 hours, yeah. But it's, it's basically the form of, hey, um, I'm going to push my data to it, and I need it once every every year for audit purposes or something like that or never maybe mm. but you need to have it stored because of legal reasons and then if you if you if you um if you require data if somebody comes to you and like hey we need your history of whatever and then you can tell get them in in 12 hours so and that's perfectly mm. fine for most use cases when it comes to that kind of data that's just i everybody can wait 12 hours or but it's yeah. mostly not 12 hours but yeah it's uh <laughs> yeah but it can be i mean remember our slas are absolute worst case so we calculate yeah. what was the worst case it can take to do obviously if the service is running everybody's trying to retrieve data for whatever Correct. reason um do you know about the s3 vaults and the locking mechanism no what are those did you know darker that you can go write files inside a glacier and add them to a vault and lock them and say you may not delete this file for the next 10 years or touch it and then that lock will not allow you to change the file I've heard of that a long time mm. ago, but have not uh, have not worked with it. Oh, interesting. Okay, mm. that's also it's on the compliance level because where that makes a lot of sense is that, for example, you need to um, store backup snapshots so that okay. if somebody wants to come audit you, and you need to be able to assure them that yes, that is the real 
copy of that one in point in time because let's be honest i can go restore a database in time edit it re-backup right. it change the file stamp and say here's the backup where um there's actually like guarantees on that service that are that, that is provable that says this has not been tampered with or modified since the date that you put it in that's very cool Mm. And, and I, I, I see that being important, especially in, in companies mm. that have high require high audit requirements. Yeah, you know, you can prove that hey, this data has not been tampered with; it's just been sitting there. Uh, yeah. I like that. I like that. Be I think that's a very cool feature. Because I'm um, so way back, like many years ago, I worked on um, uh, credit card processing systems, and at the end of okay. the day, at the bottom, there is a database. It has a row. It has your balance in it as okay. plain numerical values. You can go in theoretically if you've got admin rights. And just go update set Quibus one million. Okay. Um, yeah, you shouldn't obviously, and there yeah. are cross checks and multiple records to keep track of them, be able to rebuild it. But still, there are ways you can go fuzz it probably. Right. Mm. Mm, interesting. But I think yes. that's, that's, that's very. Cool. Geo DNB, you're touching on a very interesting one. Think GDPR. I request okay. my data to be removed. How do we delete that out of a, a backup that's been stored and is locked? Um, I actually don't have an answer to that one, but I do yeah. know that there are people that are building systems for that. But they're also GDPR. I think there are ways around it because they do take that in account. I've, I remember having a discussion from that. Um, I, I think. I think that. So here, here's the thing. I think the point here comes that you don't store personally identifiable data. So yeah. uh, PII, person, person, personally mm. identifiable information. So you do not store that, and hence, no matter what you store and how for how long, it's GDPR compliant. Okay, GDPR. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. Don't don't take my advice from GDPR. Uh, but uh, that's my understanding that GDPR applies to personally identif identifiable information. Yeah. And if you do not store it, you should be okay, right? So, the information mm -hmm. you store on S3 should be not tampered, but changed in such a way that um, that it should be GDPR compliant. But mm -hmm. if, if it, and this is where the problem of GDPR came initially is that. You had companies before GDPR ever existed that stored the data, and they stored it in such a way that they have to archive it for years and years because of law. And they had problems because now they would have to anonymize that data and put it yeah. back. So, so it, I actually worked on a system that 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 uh, did this. It was split into the front end. There was a receiving section that got all the data was for. Um, uh, personal health data that was processed. So the the API itself, there was one completely separate API with its own uh, storage system and encryption, everything that as soon as the data came in, it did a yeah. mapping between the user and just a random grid. Um, okay. And then from there, it would actually take the data and pass it into the secondary backend system that okay. only worked with grid. So in the backend, you had no clue um, in terms of you just saw numbers, as well, uh, hexadecimal number. Um, but yeah, it's, and that's an easy way to do it because then you have to worry about GDPR and at that layer, because if you yeah. delete that mapping, you have no idea whose data that is. Correct, correct. I think that's the proper way to approach it, right? You have this mapping mm. between user information and data for sales and whatnot, right? So, and but, for a lot of a lot of the times, you don't really care who the user is, like especially if you want to do some things uh, with uh, with an anal analysis of the data, unless you're doing some personalization thing. But you don't really care about who the person mm. actually is. You can just call it redacted, right? Uh, and and use that as as information. Uh, I'm not sure. So I'm not here's sure. the kicker. Here's the kicker where it becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, think about how you would do tracing and troubleshooting in that system because you did not have a centralized log system because okay. you had two. The, you cannot have the both sets of logs in the same place because otherwise you can just do the mapping based yeah. on timestamp saying this request came in, therefore it's that user. So we had two different log systems, two different ways of looking at it, and tracing was very, very difficult because right, you couldn't right. really do that, yeah. Fair point. <laughs> that, that I mean, that brings a whole nother problem. But I mean, you know, at, at least people have started, you know, if you're moving from now, um, storing data in the GDP com GDPR compliant way is possible. And storing mm -hmm. data for a long, long, long time is also possible um, for cheap. So <laughs> I think this is where the problem is. Like I had a customer which um, um, which stored mass amounts of data and they use S3 for it. Um, and basically the, the discussion was like, uh, how often do you access this data? Well, you know, maybe every every three months we access it once, um, a proportion of that data. How about this? You partition that data into, into chunks and put it on Glacier. And then mm. <laughs> they saved like 85% of stuff of cost. <laughs> it was like ridiculous. Here's yeah. a fun one. Do you know about S3 lifecycle policies? 
That, yeah. <laughs> That's a very so good for thing. So for, for those not familiar, you can actually on a per bucket level with uh, different prefix filters say that if this data has been in the bucket for X number of days, move it to another tier or back it up or delete it. Lots of things like that. And also, um, similarly, the intelligent tiering will actually look at data. If you switch enable that on the bucket, it'll see if the data is being accessed frequently. If it's not, it moves it into the um, infrequent access yeah. um, stage um, automatically. And then if you do start accessing, it'll move it back again. So there's a, uh, the, the costing is a little bit interesting because obviously you pay less uh, for the infrequent access than for the current one. And there's a small uh, processing um, charge on top of doing that pop yeah. moving for you. But if you don't need that kind of like bouncing it between the two, just go with uh, the lifecycle policies and have it automatically move it away yeah. to wherever. And, and I, would, I would like to argue that a lot for a lot of data you store, you don't access it. Uh, if you're if mm -hmm. you if you're storing data in S3, like as, as data that you may require sometimes, you're probably not accessing it. The difference is when we talk about data lakes, and then we talk about uh, data that that needs to be analyzed. That basically just yeah. is going to be actively used. That's something else. But for data that you just store, like you know, archival stuff, uh, and a lot of companies need to do that. Like, I, I'm not sure how is it in South Africa, but in 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 Serbia, you have to have records of financial data for I think ten years. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, and you have to store them. Uh, we had folks store financial data on paper in like vaults, and that was like a thing you would have to do. So. Well, so <laughs> South Africa, interesting. So medical records, um, my mom's retired now, but she used to do ultrasounds and she had to keep the records for 18 years and nine months. Wow. Well, not quite nine months, but a bit less because when you normally typically see someone who's pregnant, it's about at eight or 10 weeks. But from that period until the child is 18, she has okay. to keep all the records. So she still has like boxes to the ceiling in the uh, garage because she only retired wow. a few years ago that wow. she still has to keep. And Technically, she'll have to keep it um, till she's in the eighties, I think. Wow, that's that's yeah. odd. Uh, my, I mean, so that's like that she personally has to keep those things, right? It's like oh, because yeah. she was she was doing it privately, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, Private yeah. okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Wow, that's that's interesting. I mean, I I never had to work with any data myself that I had to keep, uh, luckily. But uh, I know that medical records and financial transactions have to be kept due to like I know that you can get an audit at one point, like. Give me your data from ten years ago, and you have to just produce it. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it is. It is. Uh, it, it can be complex, but hey, um, luckily now you don't have to print stuff out. Uh, you can you can keep the storage, and and I mean keeping yours uh, unless it's a very specific law, but um, uh, keeping your storage in a, your data in a digital form on a, on a long term storage, especially with things like Vault, I think that's just great. You can uh, your auditors mm -hmm. would be happy to just look at that and <laughs> not having to store boxes of, of paper and <laughs> ultrasounds and whatnot. So mm -hmm. that that is that is very 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 much more uh, preferential here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so just quickly, we are getting we've got about thirty minutes wow. left in this session. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, you know time flies when you're having been, fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, do you want to do a quick call out for those that are following us? Because I see the bulk of the viewers are actually viewing on the AWS channel. Uh, mm -hmm. Do give in the now to point the right way that we're down there mm -hmm. uh, in the middle here. You can see our Twitch channels for both myself and Darko. Give us a follow there because we are entering reinvent season, which means we cannot stream on the official Correct. AWS one. So if you do find these interesting, we are going to continue through the uh, reinvent, but we can't use the AWS channel. So um, we will effectively disappear. Um, so if you have this for a couple of weeks, yeah, yeah. Well, but a month, we're not gone, but we're least. a yeah. month, yeah. But we're not gone. So do join mm. us uh, on our uh, to on our YouTube and and the Twitch channels. We're gonna be streams still streaming, but mm -hmm. only to these YouTube and Twitch channels. So uh, make yeah. sure to join us there, um, uh, or give us a follow and a subscribe and all those things. Speaking of subscribes, I am almost to one thousand subscribers on YouTube. Ta -da! Nice! <laughs> wow! I, I need to share. It's this. been um, going really well there. It, it has been. I'm very <sighs> happy with it. My... So I don't even know where my one is. Let Let me show the 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 back how it actually looks. See, ha! Huh. I have 990 new, uh, 992 subscribers on my channel. So eight more to go. So everybody in the chat, YouTube <laughs> slash Rob12. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 there you get it, you brought them. Uh, yeah, I, oh, I'm only on 329, but then also again, I haven't posted a video in months. Yeah, eh, but I haven't, I haven't really published videos. I've, I've been meaning to, but like Darko mentioned, it's reinvent season, and 
yeah it's... so I've, I've been doing i've been doing i've been kind of uh, like so if you if you remember I've, I've been doing a lot of streaming on on twitch before and now because of reinvent and all the things happening i cannot do i don't do streaming as much as often right now so i've been doing something alternative uh um, this video here is uh basically me going to the forest and talking about certain technology and i talked like about cloud formation it, it's it's a it's it's a weird format but it was i think it was relatively easy for me to record because it took me like um Basically, it's like a seven minute long video where I just talk about the uh, cloud formation while walking through a forest. And there's also like some uh, information on the side and all the things um, uh, <laughs> as well. But um, I did this and I've actually recorded one more video last, no, this week on Tuesday. Tuesday, yes. on some, some I recorded another video like this uh, on the topic of um, uh, CDK. So uh, I'm currently editing it because, and also no virtual camera anymore. So it's proper horizontal normal person camera recording so i recorded one more uh, like this on cdk mm. and i plan to do more of these um because hey it's a bit different uh two questions one darko yeah. didn't you get lost in this video in the forest <laughs> i did i found my way back yes <laughs> as we can see yeah, exactly yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the second question i want to ask i'm just curious i know i'm in the southern hemisphere and you know this the season thing is normally odd but Aren't you heading into winter, and winter means lots of rain? Well, actually, it's raining like crazy right now. So uh, I've uh, we had the warm days this week, a few sunny days. So I've actually managed to record a warm sunny day uh, in the forest. But uh, I may have a few more days left in the in the in the yellow forest to record something. And I have a big plan for um, one of one of one of my interactions with Yukovis uh, coming up. Um, I would like to attempt to record a full on presentation, like a webinar in the forest. So. Um, uh, <laughs> I... <laughs> I will attempt to see, do see, that. here's the thing. I would love to try and join you with that endeavor, but there's a very high non-zero likelihood that I'll get mugged and robbed if I try it in okay. my forest here. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I'm not going to do that, unfortunately. <laughs> I can do it in my back garden, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Sorry. Uh, here, is, here is okay. Uh, I've actually... Um, so I haven't spoken to you about this, but hear me out. I have a, actually, this is for everybody. We have a webinar series coming up in November um, uh, for the South African region. Uh, it's for everybody. It's online. So, um, Sub Saharan. Sub Saharan, sorry. Hi. Uh, Sub Saharan Africa. Sub Saharan African region. So, uh, I plan to, we plan to do a bunch of, uh, uh, what's the overall topic of that webinar series? Oops. Sorry, Doc, uh, you broke up there. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> well, my Sorry, talk, I can't hear you. Uh, my talk is on the topic of observability. <laughs> so uh, I would like to um, do... Uh, my talk is going to be on observability. So monitoring, uh, tracking, all the things you want to do on your applications on AWS. And uh, I will... I'm currently trying to uh, record the, the talk on, on that. And um, I want to do it in the forest. And um, you know that old saying, you can't see the three from the forest? Yeah, I'm going to try to shoehorn that thing in. <laughs> I'm going to talk about observability is that you need to see things. Observe. The leaf observe. just fell. Exactly. So um, I, have a, I have a plan. I, I'm taking my camera. I'm taking a, a tripod, and that's it. Basically, a laptop. Uh, so I'm going to sit somewhere in the Berlin forest um, and uh, av annoy the people who are picking mushrooms because apparently it's mushroom season right now. So everybody's in the forest picking mushrooms. And there's going to be a bald, um, <laughs> bald boomer there talking about technology and observability. So... Should be fun. Let me check over here. Sorry, this has been a very busy year with webinars. Uh, for wait, for those asking, think... it's not 1,000 yet. It's 994 now, so uh, six more to go. Aww. Um, uh, what should I do for yeah. my 1,000 subscriber? I, I think... Um... Shave your beard. <laughs> 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 Once we reach 1 million, maybe. But Sorry. Man. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit loud there. I was being loud and mean. Um, <laughs> my wife my me. wife would leave me immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't recognize me, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, Speaking of, I found an even older audio document. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I need to add a darko Twitch emote. Oh, I think I, I think I cannot. I need more. I need more subscribers on Twitch or something like mm. that. Uh, no, not more subscribers. I think I need more viewers or something. There, there's a, there's a thing on Twitch where you have to evolve uh, as you as you use. I could only add a single emote, and that is uh, the Kobus emote. So I've I like if you go to my uh, YouTube my Twitch channel you can you can have this one um, um, a Kobus emote so <laughs> which is so the yeah, same yeah, thing basically check, check this out quickly let's see if I can focus on it uh, it's too much light but it's uh, an old okay. thing oh my god that's go. you uh, yep from years ago I was sixteen. Wow. 
my God. old ID document that I found. I'm busy cleaning my man cave. Wow, man. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. We'll, we will be sharing information on this upcoming webinar series online. So do, do make mm. sure to follow us on the things um, because uh, again, we tend to do a lot of webinars as well. Besides this, it's like an official database thing where we where you will go to like, it's usually go to webinars, a platform or something mm. like that where you can, um, 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 no links yet. I think that doesn't exist. Uh, so, no, uh, no, 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 it does. Do we have Give it? me a second. Okay, yeah. Kobus, is, oh. Kobus is getting it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but um, nothing has been recorded, uh, or at least not nothing from my side has been recorded. Um, no, I don't even have a presentation yeah. created. So <laughs> it should be interesting. The only thing that concerns me, Kobus, how do I do a demo in the forest? The question is, if you do a demo and nobody sees it, did you do a demo? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, demo in the forest, especially because I have uh, uh, the internet that is horrible. So I may have to uh, <laughs> do something weird about the demo or something. <laughs> Here we go. Let me just double check of this page. Yep. Holy cow, that's a long URL. Uh, okay, I need to make this shorter. Sorry. Uh, bitly, bitly the stuff. Where's my bitly? Hey, where'd my bitly go? Also, thank you everybody oh, for wait. the subscriptions. I, I, I see that I yeah. have a few, few bumps in the subscription right now. Thank you. Um, yeah, almost there, almost to I, 1000. I hate windows and pinning things. Stop sharing. Sorry. It's there we go. Um, windows when I, I've got multiple Chrome profiles and it keeps moving my icons all around in the task bar okay. for some weird ass reason. I don't know why. Um, dog, what shall we call this one? Um, oh, I know. Okay. You know, oh, 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 create bitly paste the long URL. Uh, add a title. Uh, Jude, did you s sub to the channel? Uh, to my Twitch channel? Really? What? Wait. Uh, uh, oh, you got it. Excellent. So, um, if, if if for those who do not know on Twitch, if you if you are uh, don't don't subscribe, please don't don't money. Just follow. I think that should be fine. I, I think I enabled for everybody. Uh, <laughs> If you follow my, if you are, are part of my Twitch channel, if you follow my Twitch channel, you can get this emote. You can get the Cobus emote. So Cobus emote is mm. always important. So if anybody asks you anything about technology, you just post, put the Cobus emote there and, you know, gives mm. you the answer. But the the thing, the thing. Yes, there's that one. And uh, there's another one. But a bit, a bit, a bit of thoughts around that time. Uh... Yeah, don't say. Oh, we haven't. Uh, there's one on microservices security observability. That one, unfortunately, we haven't scheduled yet, or I don't have a link for it yet. So apologies. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, question here, actually, we have got one here, which is AWS and storage related. So oh, there we go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, does AWS pair well with Windows servers regarding hard drive performance IOPS? Um, yes. And just quickly to back this up is a fact that a lot of people don't actually know is that we run more Windows workloads than other yeah. cloud providers. Like in AWS is by far the largest place to run Windows workloads. And also we look at our infrastructure, uh, depending on what performance you want on the disk, you can go for the GP2 partition, which is a burstable general purpose one. Or if you want dedicated IOPS, you can actually pick um, the IO one or two uh, flavors and specify what the IOPS are and you can yeah. guarantee them up, up front. There's like uh, Waffles mentions, there's FSX, if you want to do a, a proper a shared file system as well. Um, you can also use the I family, which has got NVE uh, solid state disks locally attached to the machine if you want really blazing fast performance. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there are a multitude of options. So yes, definitely. Um, also, the other nice part is that, remember, with Windows comes a licensing fee. That licensing fee is baked into the per second billing for you. Uh, so it makes it simple. You spin the instance up, you use it for as long as you need, and you shut it down again. Um, um, Jude, I see that you have subscribed to my Twitch channel. Don't do that. Please don't don't spend money on this on me. No. Uh, can you send me a message on LinkedIn or Twitter, please? I want to give you something. Uh, I don't want you to spend money on me, man. Come on. Uh, no. It's This is free. This is for everybody. Don't. Cobus, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can make the Cobus, Cobus emote. Uh, I want to see if I can make the Cobus emote available to everybody. I believe I have. If, you, if you're if you just following my channel, you should get the emote, I think. <sighs> you can't put the price of Cobus emote. You can, that's fair. Like, uh, it's priceless, I agree, but... <laughs> 
What I do want is the, I, I still need to make a little GIF, um, and preferably 8-bit one, for the sad panda from uh, Battle Royale. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so Remedies, another question. Mm. Uh, what about Firewall? Are, are VMs, WMs, are VMs somehow, somewhat DDoS protected? Well, um, Firewalls, we have this thing called security groups, which are basically firewalls attached to, are they stateful or stateless? Stateless firewalls attached to your EC2 instances, um, basically which you define how, what is accessed with. When it comes to DDoS protection, we have a service called Database Shield, which is enabled by default mm. for everybody, which offers basics, basic DDoS protection. So um, we have a massive array of, of things out there to kind of prevent DDoS. If you want to go advanced and you want to make sure that no DDoS issue happens, or which is very difficult, but um, there's a Shield Advance, which costs a certain amount of money per month. And then you get um, you get a DDoS response team, basically the team within database that can help you deal with the DDoS mm. attack. And you also get financial protection from a DDoS attack, which mm. we can refund some costs. You have uh, you have occurred uh, in the terms of storage, uh, in the terms of, uh, of, of resources on AWS um, due to uh, due to uh, um, uh, due to the due to the DDoS attack. So yeah, mm. and there's benefits. also uh, WEF, which is Web Application Firewall, which is is not specifically DDoS, but allows you to put uh, some intelligent rules in place to prevent, obviously, and if you can spot the pattern of who the bad actors are to do. Right. Um, but I mean, typically DDoS, um, there's not, not an easy spotable pattern for that. Yeah, DDoS is this thing that's super difficult to work with. I mean, it's, mm. it's very difficult to kind of, uh, like there's no thing you can do to kind of uh, kind of <laughs> pre prevent DDoS because that's the whole point of DDoS. It's a, it's a distributed denial of service. So. No, but didn't, didn't he just say AWS Shield? It helps again, but it's you know it's it's limited, right? So uh, it's yeah. there's no there's no ultimate defense from from DDoS. I mean, mm. Shield can help you. That's why there's financial protection there because there nobody can guarantee you like oh no DDoS will ever uh, uh, be be done. So yeah, that's kind of how it goes. Actually, let me just quickly before we end off, just bring up that um, this is from earlier this year in June. Uh, let me just okay. bring up the article. It's on ZDNet. Uh, where's my share screen again? uh boom boom um so basically this article if you can search for it we actually had a, a 2.3 terabit per second ddos attack which is massive wow. um, and there's some details in here no i don't want to why do you want my location <sighs> no i don't want the newsletter <laughs> this this is my streaming profile where i don't have all my ad blockers and my normal usual things um in it to actually protect it but yeah there's um you can actually see the some values here in terms of how big the DDoS attacks are. Yeah. And one of the things that I found fascinating is what they call amplification attacks nowadays, um, where they you find devices that are vulnerable that if you send them a message, they will send you a message that's larger than the payload that you send them. And you okay. can fake the actual request so it sends it to a different IP. So typical things like, um, I don't want to say printers, um, there might be something like printers, but think like other non-computer devices okay. uh, or services running. You send them a request and they just send something bigger back, but then you re redirect it at your target. So you just find a whole list of these vulnerable um, systems. You send them the request and they then yeah. go and it's the other thing with a, a, a multiplier on top of the amount that you send. So you're limited by how much you can actually send them in the end. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, we, have we ever figured out where you come from? I mean... We don't know. So <laughs> I know um, I know where it came from. I'm more than happy to say. The internet. Oh <laughs> snap, my God. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help trolling there. Uh thank you, W Screen, for cleaning this out. Uh, they are stateful. Okay, mm. thank you. Um apologies. Yeah, I I I, I always yeah. confuse the, those things. So <laughs> them them and the ACLs. The ACLs are stateless. ACL are stateless. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's that's yes, a fair yeah. point. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Um with that being said, we are three minutes across the time. Um, so um first of all thank you everybody for joining and chatting and we mm. always love this interaction because it's boring watching just two of us talk uh we like to have interaction with the audience uh thank you for being active thank you for for um for uh, well well being with us on stream um and it was it was a fun thing we went through a the history of, of storage mediums and um, some of the things people used <laughs> just 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 as you and if, if you decrypt this is a bitcoin private wallet just kidding <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually uh, this is just uh, uh, plus uh, the zeros and ones. The the audio is just basically the, you will hear the 
thing uh, mm. on there. Um, and yeah, thank you, thank you for the subscribe, GODB, uh, GOD, uh, NB. Uh, as I told you, l reach out to me. I don't want you to pay for these kind of things. And I, mm. I, I looking yeah. at Twitch, I, I think I, I cannot make the emote available for everybody. So I'm sorry. So even if you wish to subscribe, if you, if you want the Cobus emote. Subscribe with Amazon Prime or something like that because it's it's free uh, if you're using Amazon Prime. Uh, and just for one month, I think you will get uh, the email forever. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, reInvent is coming up. Don't forget that. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. It was a fun... We fun, will see you on Monday. We will be seeing you all on Monday. We'll discuss what the topic is going to be on Monday. But... Um, or just use your channel points. There you go. If you have channel points on my Twitch channel, there we go. You can get an uh, emote. Oh free even better um so thank you all and um have a lovely weekend and we will see you monday morning for the next edition of uh well bean streaming bye bye cool yeah cheers